have followed closely developments of the Arab Spring, communications, technologies, and in particular, social media have played a crucial role in connecting and collecting people for democratic actions and transmitting these events to the outside world, to, to us. Till today, communication technologies have always also promoted good governance by facilitating citizens' access to public services and participation in legislative processes. But this vital technology has also been used as a tool for repression and intimidation. With the same technology, citizens have been controlled or denied access for information. Hence, the ICT has raised concerns related to human rights. These should be taken into account in formulating and implementing the EU foreign policy. The question is, where do we draw the line between promoting free trade and freedom of expression and repression of human rights? Who is responsible, coffee please, who is responsible for how the technology is used? Is it the producers, vendors, or buyers? I am happy that uh, we have the opportunity to discuss both challenges and possibilities of the ICT, and above all, common solutions to a global issue. We have here the representation of various stakeholders, the political institutions, the industry, as well as the civil society. Before opening the floor for today's guests, I would like to invite my colleague, Mariette Schake, to give her welcoming remarks. And Mariette is one of the most vocal proponents of human rights in the European Union Parliament. And I am happy to co-share this meeting with you. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Anneli, and thank you all for being with us this afternoon. We look forward to uh, a lively debate after the introductions of our uh, esteemed and appreciated guests. Um, my name is Marietje Schake. I'm a member of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe with uh, Anneli and a member of the Dutch party called D66, Democrat 66. Uh, and in this parliament, I work on issues related to foreign policy, uh, international trade, and Europe's digital agenda. So I've looked at this issue a little bit from the beginning uh, of my mandate in this parliament in 2009, because at the time that I was elected in the summer of 2009, by voicing criticism to my government and being ambitious about a new uh, relation between uh, my country and, and Europe and the world. Uh, a woman in Iran who did the same, her name was Nada Aga Sultan, uh, was murdered, killed by her own government for voicing criticism. And we all were eyewitness to her murder because the person that she was on the street with to demonstrate peacefully filmed the moment that a bullet uh, lethally struck her on a mobile phone and uploaded it online. Later in Tunisia, um, when uprisings began there, uh, we saw how there was sort of a cat and mouse game between activists who were seeking to avoid censorship, the deployment of viruses uh, to their email communications and their use of social, social media by the Ben Ali government, who was actually um, well known for their uh, skillful use of technologies to repress uh, people's fundamental human rights. In Egypt, demonstrators who uh, entered a police station found files of all their email communications, mobile phone communications and messages um, taken by the secret services, uh, both on uh, mobile internet and also voice over IP such as Skype. Uh, what we also learned in Egypt was that uh, 
telecom operators, uh, also from Europe, such as Vodafone, which is a majority shareholder of Vodafone Egypt, were pressured to shut down for their services online and on mobile entirely. Uh, while at the same time uh, passing through text messages by the Mubarak government. In Syria, until a few months ago, uh, an Italian company called Area SPA was helping to build a monitoring center for Bashar al-Assad, which when finished would have enabled his government, secret services and state companies to uh, monitor and centralize all email and mobile communications uh, in Syria. And we all know that that would not be uh, for legitimate reasons. Um, when I started to look into what had exactly happened in Iran after the presidential elections in 2009 and in the uprisings, uh, one of the things um, I learned was the role that new technologies play and that mobile phone communication play. And uh, in learning more and finding out what had happened on the ground, we also learned that the uh, mobile phone network uh, was um, provided by Nokia Siemens networks uh, in the years before and that several Western companies were actually working uh, on the ground in Iran but also in Tunisia, Egypt, Syria and many, many places in the world. I cannot mention them all but this is a widespread issue. And what we can see is that on the one hand, um, the increased use of mobile phones, uh, internet and other new technologies can be a great enabler of human rights. People were able to organize themselves, um, engage in meetings, uh, access information despite censorship. Um, they could uh, freely speak and reach the outside world. Documented human rights violations could be shared in real time. And there, uh, there were a number of opportunities, and there are a number of opportunities there which are very, very valuable. Uh, on the other hand, we see that there is a very professional and systematic use of censorship, monitoring, and repressing through those same technologies. And so we can actually speak of sort of a double-edged sword. And even though we may think that societies like the one in Iran or in Syria or in Egypt are very, very different from our own, we see similar kind of tensions uh, between the need to control and monitor and the uh, ability to use the use of mobile and uh, new technologies for good, such as in the United Kingdom after there were riots where uh, government uh, immediately proposed to shut down instant messaging services in uh, the region of the riots because they thought this would be a good way to control and to prevent um, young people from talking to each other about what stores might have been broken into and where sneakers could be stolen, for example. Uh, and there was a lot of protest against that, and it was soon discovered that the use of instant messaging uh, and mobile devices could actually greatly benefit uh, the police and uh, local authorities to sort out uh, what had actually happened and to find uh, people who, who were accused of committing crimes. So knee-jerk reactions uh, in a crisis situation or in a, in a situation of unrest uh, have been met with uh, attempts to control um, the use of mobile and other technologies just as much in the EU as in the rest of the world. And of course the consequences are different, but it does immediately impact the credibility of the EU uh, as we saw in responses to this UK incident that I mentioned from, com from countries like China and Iran who said, if you need help uh, getting your riots under control, we, we have some experience to share. And what's important here is not to um, not to just uh, sort of be uh, upset about the way in which human rights are violated, which is of course uh, very, very concerning and something that we work on, but really to look at what uh, can be improved. Because we're facing very rapid technological developments and um, for those of you who have been in this parliament before, the process and the speed with which laws are passed in a democratic society doesn't always go in parallel and certainly doesn't go in parallel speed in this case. Uh, although I believe it is fundamentally important that we uh, integrate the role that technologies play uh, into our policies, whether it is about security, whether it is about enhancing freedom, uh, guaranteeing human rights, whether it is about trade, or whether it is about access to information or culture, there's a number of issues where we have to uh, adjust our policies to be relevant, uh, credible, and adequate in our fundamental uh, responsibilities here in Europe. So uh, I'm glad that I've been 
uh, asked to lead the development of a strategy for Europe for digital freedom in the world. And I'm working on that, and in my initial findings, uh, I've learned that we all have a role to play. Uh, I've had many discussions with Nokia Siemens Networks before because they were one of the first companies that has been named uh, for the role it played, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Leighton will talk about that, uh, in Iran. And I think it is worth mentioning that it is um, very nice of them to always participate in panels like this. Uh, and I've sat on panels with Nokia Siemens Networks representatives on a number of occasions, and it is a discussion that this company has been willing to engage in. Um, again, there are many, many other companies, some of which we know, and I think that that is an important item for our discussion today. Telecom providers that are European or, or work elsewhere are usually well-known companies. Uh, they provide services or products that uh, many citizens use and that are very important in, in daily life. Uh, although there's also other companies that provide technologies which can be used for repression, which uh, name is not as known to consumers and where uh, bringing uh, the, the story about what happened in, in the newspapers has a very, very different impact. So I think we should appreciate this open discussion and we should actually benefit from it today as well. Uh, I think companies have an important role to play. Uh, I think NGOs and people on the ground have an important role to play to teach us what it means for them in a very, very different context to use these technologies and services. And for us as policy and lawmakers, we must uh, uh, work with others to ensure that we have uh, the adequate laws and provisions in place. Uh, and I think besides looking at the technical aspects, we should look at the, at the context within which technologies uh, are used. I'll name two examples and I'll end there. Um, telecom providers such as the ones at our table uh, today are bound by a lot of technical um, uh, restrictions or guidelines or laws uh, for everything that they produce. And one of those, which has been established on the European level, is that there should always be uh, a possibility for lawful interception. I don't know how many of you have heard that word, but I've heard it so many times that it almost becomes a very common term. Lawful interception, LI is what some people call it. But what is this really? Lawful interception means that police uh, and um, uh, justice authorities can use technologies to look at where a missing person is, to tap the phone of a suspect uh, in a legal case. But the concept of lawfulness has a lot to do with the existence of the rule of law. Uh, we are, in Europe, guaranteed uh, our, our fundamental rights. Uh, we can challenge the state if our phone has been tapped uh, unlawfully. Uh, in fact, uh, if all functions properly, um, our phones cannot be tapped or our email traffic cannot be tapped without a warrant uh, or uh, a court order. But the same technology is exported to societies where it has been widely established that the rule of law is absent or is failing, uh, leads to a very different situation because the same technologies can be used and are used by um, secret services, uh, police and law enforcement, but also state-owned companies for very, very different purposes. Another term that is often used in this context is how the export of technology should be regulated, because that would then be another way in which to look at which technologies end up where. And the term dual use will often uh, come to play in this discussion, which is meant to say as much as that technologies can be used for very different things. Let's say they can be used for good things or neutral things, but they can also be used for, for bad things, depending on whose hands they fall into. Uh, but at this moment, uh, there are also technologies, and I think it is time to bring that element into the discussion, and hopefully also today, uh, technologies which should be identified as single-use technologies. There's hardly anything good that some of these systems can be used for. Uh, they are very, very specifically designed uh, to, to intercept um, and to track and trace individuals, especially in countries where um, human rights are, are systematically violated. So there's a number of challenges, and I know that um, companies like the telecom providers here uh, today face challenges on a daily basis. Uh, in the case uh, of Vodafone uh, in Egypt, uh, you know, when you employ several thousand people uh, and, 
and uh, there's a threat to your services, what does it mean for your local employees? What would it mean uh, to step away from orders for a government? What does it mean in terms of contracts that are binding uh, to do business in a very different country? All these questions are very relevant, and um, the final word hasn't been said about it, but I hope we can discuss it today, and I appreciate the opportunity, uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, sorry, I'm going to introduce <laughs> to you uh, the first speaker. Uh, we're very happy he's here. Uh, it is Ben Wagner, who is a researcher at European University Institute in Florence. He coordinates the Dynamic Coalition on Freedom of Expression and Freedom of the Media at the UN Internet Governance Forum, and he has done research in the US, the UK, France, Germany, Spain, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan. Uh, he will share uh, some of the highlights of his academic work. Mr. Wagner, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Schake, and thank you for convening this meeting. I think it's an extraordinarily important topic, and I think that we've already started discussing some of these issues. I'd like to go into a little bit more depth on two specific cases. The first is uh, Tunisia, and the second is Syria. If you could have the next slide, please. So, I mean, at a meeting like this, and especially with the, the people we're talking to, it seems an extraordinarily simple and straightforward thing to say that the internet can be controlled. I mean. I can already see the first row falling asleep before I've even started saying it. There's no particular point at this point in time to mention it anymore, that uh, there's a capacity for control there. But I think it's important to remember that we've only found out in the last few years the extent to which this is happening. So over the last few years, particularly since Iran, but also since the Arab Spring, we've begun to realize the extent to which this is possible and also the impact that this can have on human rights. So next slide, I'd like to just mention specifically two important cases, as I mentioned. The one is Tunisia, and Tunisia is particularly interesting because it was the beginning of the Arab Spring. It was the, one of the first countries in the region that uh, gave hope to many of the other countries in the region, and I still think gives uh, hope to many parts of the world that uh, given the appropriate choices, change can be possible. At the same time, if you look at Syria, Syria seems almost the exact opposite. There's a bloody struggle there, there's huge problems, there's thousands of people who have died, and yet in a rather strange sense from a European perspective, the two countries have something in common. And the fact of the commonality is that both countries were supported by European companies in censoring, controlling, and surveilling their internet. So to just start with, next slide please, Tunisia. This is just an example of the censorship regime in Tunisia in various different stages. Um, I won't go through it in great detail, but just to give you a rough idea, these are the four different steps that are over a period of time since 1996 when it started and then in 97 when it was implemented, the various different stages of censorship in Tunisia. And again, it's, I don't want to, to bore you too much with detail, but the important point is that at each stage in this evolution of the system, there was a various different, not always European, sometimes also North American, but in general there were international corporations that supported this development at every stage of the, the evolution of the overall system. And it's important to note that each layer that's added to this system of censorship in Tunisia adds an additional level of control and also an additional uh, response to what is civil society's attempt to get around this. And so each time the system develops, each time there's an attempt to adapt and to be able to, to say what you think and also to read what you believe you should be able to read, the system responds and it's supported in doing so. Next slide, please. And there's, there's several things I think that you can, you can learn from the example of Tunisia at a relatively obvious sense. Sorry that you have to turn around and look at the slides backwards. Um, the first is that um, there are several layers of censorship, but also each layer needs help. Tunisia can't do it on its own. It's not capable of just developing these systems as of magic, and they're actually relatively complex to develop. And in most of these stages, European companies were involved in selling the technology. At the same time, it's not just the technology itself, there were also maintenance uh, providers, so various consulting services, as well as software updates that were provided, and various other forms of support beyond just exporting the technology. So you need to look at a, a wider systemic approach to understanding how the, the supporting and addressing of these issues works. And if you could have the next slide, please, thanks. If you turn to Syria, um, it's again a very different country, and yet again we have these commonalities. We have an existing surveillance system now to look at surveillance rather than censorship, a bloody conflict, and in the middle of this conflict, as if the conflict itself wasn't difficult and problematic enough and costing enough lives, um, the Syrian government decided that it needed an additional surveillance system beyond what was already there. And this additional surveillance system was on top of what they already had. So they already had US imported um, technologies which were being used for surveillance, and then an additional system was installed. And it's interesting if you look in the specific context that the 
The additional system was built by a consortium of what you could call European technology providers working together with different aspects. It was led by an Italian company, which by the has already mentioned. And I think the, the additional surveillance systems, if you look at them, it's, it's almost like European technological cooperation. You have an Italian company, a German component, a French component, and even a North American component. So this is clear multilateral cooperation. And at the same time, I can have the next slide, please. What's particularly interesting is that when, when this information about what was happening in Syria entered the public domain, this position became increasingly untenable. And this consortium of providers who were involved in this actually pulled out. So I think it is possible, on the one hand, to commend the excellent work that was done by investigative journalists in finding this information out and to civil society who supported them, but also to say that when certain information about certain types of systems is in the public domain, it will not be acceptable to European publics. This is not a tenable position, but this also then means that we need more information in order to understand what is going on in order to be able to judge that in a better way. And it's also notable to say that it wasn't just the, the companies themselves that pulled out, but it was also European policy that adapted. As a result, the sanctions regime in Syria was increased in a way that uh, didn't allow for the export of certain types of technologies to Syria. At the same time, as I've mentioned already, in a rather perverse sense, there is a marketplace for revolutions. So as soon as you're in a situation in which there's a revolution in a certain country, there are certain types of companies that will knock on the door of an authoritarian state and say, great, we have the perfect technology to help you suppress your population. So when you're faced with companies doing business in this kind of way, it sort of becomes a question, if you have a look at the next slide, what to do about this and what sort of, of policies solutions are appropriate. I don't necessarily say that there's one solution or that even that, there's, that it can be developed by any one party alone, but there, definitely if you look at the potential policy instruments at the, the, uh, that the European Union has a perspective of using, there, there are many different approaches that can be taken and will need it to be taken in order to develop this. None of those approaches will be perfect, but I think the key aspect is that at the moment we're at a stage where we need to mitigate harm. We won't perfectly ever be able to stop authoritarian states getting access to these technologies through some way or another, or be supported by services, but we can make it more difficult. We can also make it more expensive if this is something the European Union chooses to do. And I think it's important in this context to look specifically at the events of the last few years, especially the last two years since what's happened in Iran, to develop solutions from this. If we're not sure what was the, what was the solution now, it may be an option in several years' time for the next state that's false. If we could have the next slide. So, if you look at the market dynamics, and I think we have several companies here for who it might be interested in, it's relatively reasonable, uh, Ms. Sharka was already speaking beforehand about these single-use technologies. So we have certain types of single-use technologies that are typically sold by relatively small companies, and these are also the companies that will be knocking on the door of authoritarian states during revolutions. These sorts of companies, I think any form of self-regulation or even relatively soft forms of regulation is not going to help. Indeed, it's relatively well known and documented that when um, this information entered the public domain, they uh, celebrated this at a trade show and showed how proud they were as a badge of honor that they now had been found out as the people who were helping the Syrian regime. So I don't think that for these sorts of companies, it'll be appropriate to find uh, specific soft forms of regulation. At the same time, there are lots of other companies involved with this as well that are far larger. And to be perfectly honest, I think they might agree with this as well. They have far bigger fish to fry and are less interested in necessarily doing business in this way. And they would certainly be responsive to a more incentive-based system, which isn't to say that self-regulation, even in this case, might be the only appropriate thing, but perhaps that they might be far more interested in public contracts in Europe than in authoritarian states. So if I could have the next slide. The market dynamics basically show that in these two different groups, you have two types of companies. And again, for the one type, uh, really, the softer forms of regulation will not be appropriate. And you'll need to find uh, harder ways of dealing with that. At the same time, for these other types of companies, uh, there may be possibilities and opportunities to develop a regulatory framework which includes different aspects. But again, self-regulation will probably not be sufficient. Could I have the next slide? Just coming to a conclusion, there's two other aspects that I'd like to look at. One is the questions of European foreign policy and how that will develop. And lastly, the challenges that will be faced in developing both this policy and other European policies in a way that can respond to these issues. So when you're looking at the way European foreign policy in general is being created and especially created on the internet, there's the very interesting concept of human security that has been used in other parts of uh, foreign policy as a whole and I think can provide a valuable framework for moving the focus of foreign policy away from uh, foreign policy with states and closer towards human-centric uh, human foreign policy, which is centered on human beings. 
And I think that can be a, a helpful guideline or a helpful starting point to develop these types of, of foreign policy. At the same time, if you look at the, the Syrian case, I think it extremely strongly shows that when this information enters the public domain, transparency is one of the key components, and that providing European publics with the information about what's going on in these issues will mean that they will be able to change their positions. At the same time, the overall goal should be to ensure that not just companies, but also states outside of Europe um, have an interest in creating an internet which we all believe at the end of the day can support human rights and fundamental freedoms and that should be the ultimate goal. So in doing so there will be challenges as well and I think the, the key challenge first of all will be to learn the right lessons from the Arab Spring. There's been many things that have happened over the last year or so and I think it's fair to say that uh, in some policy domains the European Union did not always respond appropriately. At the same time um, it may be the case that uh, the EU can have a role in preventing companies in Europe and beyond supporting authoritarian regimes. But in order to do so, there will also be a need not just to provide greater transparency, but also to build a body of knowledge. The more we know, the more we understand, the more we think about the existing information, and the more we build on what we have already in the public domain, the better will be the opportunities both for policymakers but also for European public to make informed decisions about the, the, both the, the choices that they make about policy and also the choices they make in purchasing decisions. And finally, in a general sense, it's a challenge not just for, for human rights but for a wider internet foreign policy that the, the European Union will need to try and develop. And I hope that concepts of human security and human rights in a more general sense will be at the very core of this policy framework. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Ben Wagner, we heard the university view and now we go to the company level and I would like to welcome Krista Lehtonen and the Nokia Siemens. You are very welcome and I think we are very inter interested to know uh, and to get information about the human rights issues and also uh, the technological use. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Yatamaki. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to speak here today. And then thanks for Ms. Atemaki and Ms. Sharke for inviting uh, me as well. Um, just one word on, on, the, uh, on my colleague Ben Room, who was supposed to be here according to the original uh, agenda. So he's, uh, he has fallen ill. He's in bed right now. So wishing him well and happy to be here today on, on his behalf. Um, my name is Krista Lehtonen. I'm head of government relations in Finland for Nokia Siemens uh, Networks. And um, what I would like to present to you today is um, communication technology vendor point of view to this, uh, to this topic. And really, I would like to share with you three topics. First, uh, what we as a company learned from a specific case in Iran that already Mrs. Shake uh, referred to. And second, um, how we used what we learned to develop a company-wide approach to human rights. And then thirdly, I would like to draw some uh, conclusions for the wider industry. Now, let me start by saying that, that human rights is a, a topic of growing importance in our industry. Um, several of the examples that all the speakers so far have given have demonstrated this without any, any doubt. Uh, and for this reason, we also as a company very much welcome these type of exchanges. Uh, we need to learn from each other. Uh, and for us at Nokia Siemens Networks, and, and really due to a specific um, case of product misuse in Iran, um, we have come to understand that what really is the scope of the challenge we are facing. And uh, we believe also that we have an obligation uh, not only to address the challenge, but also to demonstrate leadership. And uh, maybe one uh, sentence about, about the company. So Nokia Siemens Networks was formed by a merger between Nokia Networks and, and Siemens Communications in April 2007. And companies such as ours have uh, traditionally delivered networks to telecom uh, providers. And, um, and, and, um, and, and these operators have been, by law, um, required to comply with different types of uh, requirements legislative, administrative, licensing, and other types of requirements set by the governments in the countries where they operate. And we also, NSN, we faced 
criticism, boycotts, even activist campaigns um, over a sale of uh, monitoring center equipment in Iran. And, and a business which we had completely withdrawn from by March 2009. Um, but this, this uh, particular piece of technology is what Mrs. Sharke referred to as lawful interception. It is something called, well, what we call active lawful inter interception technology. And we realized through our experience that the traditional industry uh, position that we as a company only deliver technology but that we have no responsibility for how our technology is being used is not acceptable anymore. And this brings me to my second topic, the need for a company-wide approach. So as a result of, of what, we, um, what we as a company learned, Nokia Siemens Network's executive board approved, and I'm proud to say as the first information communication technology vendor in the world, a human rights policy and an accompanying due diligence process directly uh, related to this, uh, to, to this matter. And, and still, on balance, we believe that communication networks promote human rights. They enable freedom of expression, access to information, sharing of ideas, and ultimately also economic development. The core of, uh, of uh, Nokia Siemens Network's human rights policy and due diligence process, then, is to be able to identify specific high-risk cases where misuse could be possible. And what we do is that we, nowadays, we systematically evaluate the country risk uh, based on a, a kind of a, uh, based on a, a country uh, um, evaluation by a third party, as well as a product risk. And we do, and we do this for each sale. This then requires us, us to have an understanding of uh, human rights risks related to privacy and freedom of expression in the countries where we operate or uh, plan to operate in, as well as deep understanding of the capabilities of our products and how they could be potentially used for unintended purposes. And in a high-risk case, we carry out an analysis with internal external experts to see whether the risk can be mitigated. If mitigation is, is not possible, we may decline a sale. And this indeed has happened. So this now brings me to my third topic, uh, conclusions and lessons learned, if you will, in regard to this topic of ICT and human rights. First, the global environment indeed has changed. Um, there is increased demand from governments to control networks on one hand, and simultaneously increasing pressure from governments and human rights organizations uh, to take responsibility where governments fail, on the other hand. And um, in the situation of, of uh, pressures pulling companies into opposite directions, companies need to have a clear and agreed approach. Our conclusion was to develop and implement uh, this human rights and due diligence uh, process and policy related to privacy and freedom of expression. And we did it according to the United Nations uh, gu uh, guidelines or guiding principles on business and human rights, this so-called protect, uh, respect, and remedy framework. And we implemented it in, into our sales tools and other tools and processes so as to make it virtually impossible not to follow it. Second, um, implementing a human rights due diligence process requires commitment from the highest level of leadership, in our case, the executive board. And, and third, uh, implementing a human rights due diligence process requires time and money. There's simply no way around it. Even a simple IT tool feature change in a global environment can be a very long project with significant cost. And following the process will also result ultimately in, uh, in sales being denied, which have also economic impact. However, given the, the pace of technological innovation and widespread availability of uh, communication technology, the challenge to human rights requires a political and industry consensus, not just a technical solution at the end of the day. Now, finally, in closing, 
I'm happy to, to share with you the fact that um, in 2011 we began uh, a wider industry dialogue with a number of telecommunications operators and vendors to address this particular uh, topic and especially related to privacy and freedom of expression in the telecommunications sector. Uh, the participants include AT&T, Alte Lucent, BT, Deutsche Telekom, France Telekom and, and Orange and Mark Fossier will be speaking uh, here later today. Uh, Telia Soneda, Tele2, Telefonica, Telenor, Vodafone and Nokia Siemens Networks and, and Millicom as well. And uh, this dialogue of telecommunications vendors and operators is guided by this uh, United Nations Business and Human Rights uh, framework that I mentioned or referred to earlier, this so-called Protect, Respect and Remedy framework. And it will explore the interaction and boundaries between a government's duty to protect human rights and the corporate responsibility of telecom providers to respect human rights. And of course, preferable would be that all companies could commit to similar approaches uh, so as to also ensure a level playing field between companies. And therefore, we need more dialogue, such as uh, this event here today. So with that, I thank you for, for your time. OK, thank you. Now, from Nokia, we, go, we will continue to Orange Group. And it would be very interesting to listen if the view is totally different or do you have similar grounds and roots? Mr. Far Mark Frossier, you are very welcome. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm Mark Frossier. I'm the chief CSR officer of the Orange Group. And I just would like, before the debate, uh, to state a few points. Uh, first, uh, who we are and uh, where we operate, because I think this gives us some feedback on the issue, very difficult issue we are tackling together. So I just remind you that the Orange Group, or France Telecom in France, uh, is not a national company. It's uh, operating in 35 countries. Uh, we have license, fixed or mobile license in 35 countries, mostly in Europe and Africa, Africa Middle East. And we have very different positions depending on countries. We might be the uh, incumbent operators, which we are, of course, in France, but also in Poland, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Jordan, and a few other ones, Mauritius Islands. Uh, but we can also be a, a newcomer. Um, which was the case actually in Tunisia as we entered as the third small operator in 2009, beginning 2010. But we experienced the situation of them. Um, we, uh, and maybe not all of you know that, we are employing a lot of people. We are 170,000 employee company. Uh, in France, we have a staff of 100,000 people, which is the operations in France plus the, the, the staff, the corporate staff. And in countries such as Ivory Coast, Spain, uh, or large countries, we are um, often above um, 5,000. And in Egypt, which by the way um, is my next point, uh, the status and the conditions of our operations might be very different from country to country. Some of our companies are listed companies in local uh, stock exchange. Uh, we can have minority shoulders. The status, joint venture agreements and things like that could be very different depending on countries. And this makes the possibility of implementing rules that we could decide together, for instance, today, quite difficult depending on local conditions that are not only legal, that could be also historical or so awesome. um, The revenue uh, from the telecom services uh, from the Orange Group is um, in the order of magnitude of 50 billion euros. And the important point to, to reinsure um, Ben is that it's coming from end users. So we are not selling technologies to government. And of course, uh, just to come back to uh, what happened in Egypt, I will comment about that. I mean, one of the main results of being forced of shutting down the networks in Egypt, Mobinil, uh, maybe you didn't uh, know that Mobinil was a uh, stake of the Orange Group. At the time of this event in March uh, 2011, we were not under control of Mobinil, but of course we had uh, some stakes in that. Um, we had the few shops in Cairo that were uh, ruined and destroyed by uh, protesters. 
and I can understand them, but unfortunately we were forced to shut down the network and send the messages. So uh, if you can imagine that we are pleased to do that uh, breaches of human rights, please feel that this is not something that uh, is uh, easy because shutting down a network is a very difficult operation and we uh, lighting the network the days after us is a very difficult situation and by the way we lose hundreds of millions of, uh, of local currency. Uh, apart from this, uh, these comments, uh, we of course each time we uh, get a license in a specific country and um, we uh, have this case from time to time. Uh, we, of course, make an assessment of the local country, of the conditions of the license, and I just would like to insist on the fact that maybe you don't know that each telecom service operation is based on a license uh, due to the use of uh, rare resources, such as a spectrum, for instance, with, uh, of course, some uh, conditions to operate and some constraints. And in all countries, and uh, our chair just reminded that, um, there are some conditions for public order uh, which go from shutting down the network in some cases and most of the license allow that in emergency cases, sending messages. If there was any uh, natural disaster in Brussels, our subsidiary Mobistar will be entitled to send emergency messages. So this is um, provided in all our licenses everywhere in France, in Belgium, in Poland, and in Iraq, uh, in Egypt, in Tunisia. So the question is not of being uh, in a condition to breach human rights. The question is the right use and the appropriate use of those lawful interceptions, shutting down of the networks, and all sorts of things that the imagination of secret services, of course, uh, invent every day. Uh, and by the way, I just want the fact that so far, I mean, a large-scale shutdown of a network had never been experienced. So we had not anticipated the fact that in Egypt, which was the case for Mubinil and for Vodafone Egypt, the armed forces could enter the CEO office, and actually it happened like that. Uh, we had uh, in Egypt an informal request, and of course it was such a big event that it went to the CEO office, and the CEO asked the chairman, and uh, after a quarter of an hour, some uh, soldiers came into the CEO office and gave 30 minutes to shut down the network to be checked by the fourth armies in the street. So uh, the question of processes or uh, procedures and things like that, I mean, we had the 30 minute lap time in order to react. So this is probably something we have to work on. And just to, to, to follow up on what my colleague from NSN said, we decided to join other players, other operators, and other uh, manufacturers to share experiences and being, uh, I mean, uh, trained by the experiences of the others and the imagination of Secret Service has no limit. Uh, it could go from filtering, location, uh, shutting down of network and things like that, and seeing how we can handle that. I fully agree with our chair that if you are in a, let's say, a lawful state, which by the way happened to be the case sometime in Europe, I mean, uh, I'm quite old in this business and I remember that the lawful interception discussion in the French parliament or in the British parliament was a nice story. Uh, and establishing what is lawful and what is the limit between public order or public safety and breach of human rights is a very key political discussion. When you have the chance of having this discussion out of the telecom operator involvement, it's fine. It's a democratic debate and then there is a law and the telecom operator applies the law. Uh, in some countries, uh, let's go back to Egypt, you probably remember that for the last 30 years, Egypt was under emergency state, which means that all the police and uh, armed forces were allowed to take any decision required by the emergency situation. So, of course, this uh, justice appeal or this uh, democratic debate cannot happen. So we started the discussion with our colleagues to see what could be alternate solutions Keeping in mind, and this is a very important point, that we feel, and this is definitely the spirit of the Orange Brand, 
that it's better for us in most cases. We have not yet got a license in Iran or in Syria, but we got license in Congo, Iraq recently, Tunisia, Egypt, and um, Ivory Coast that we feel that if we run our business correctly, it's better for the social and economic development of those countries. And we feel even if we had a 10% market share that we have played a small role in the Tunisian uh, Arab Spring. So when we are in a country, when we have people, when one of the first human rights is to protect our people, uh, how can we alleviate the risk of breaching human rights or being complicit of that? And we feel that, and this is the, the subject of the dialogue, that this could be done by identifying, I mean, very clear processes to handle sensitive requests, even if there is no justice to appeal for them, and being able to report previously and afterwards of handling those sensitive cases, whether they are interception or shutting down of the networks. And maybe, and this could be, gained by this collective action, the stakeholder participation is very important. Of course, we look for local involvement of stakeholders, which is not always easy in specific countries, but of course international stakeholders could be of good support for supporting us implementing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Forcier. Actually, now we have heard points from the university level and from two companies. And uh, we have also heard that the global environment has totally changed. So, and now I think it's very interesting and it's time to listen what the commission has to say. What are our answers? And now I want to give the floor to Mrs. Antoanera Angelova Krasteva, who is the Commission representative for the No Disconnected Strategy. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. The Commission has the privilege now to be the last speaker, uh, which means uh, I'll speak shortly, shorter than the previous speakers because they've already touched upon uh, the most important issues uh, which uh, this uh, debate has uh, in the focus, in particular, the fast growth of technology, the need of protection of uh, human rights, the need of better cooperation and knowledge sharing between private and public institutions and uh, globally. But let me first uh, start by uh, very shortly presenting, introducing myself. So my name is Antoinette Angelova Krasteva and I'm the head of unit uh, dealing with internet and uh, information and network security in uh, DG uh, IMS of the European uh, Commission. As I said, I will shorten my presentation as uh, most of the major and uh, important issues I wanted to start with have been already covered by the uh, previous speakers. I will focus my presentation primarily on um, the No Disconnect strategy, which is uh, one of uh, the flagship initiatives uh, of the Commission, which has the, create the strong support of uh, Vice President Nelly Cruz, and whose uh, implementation is actually uh, a common endeavor of the various uh, DGs. So I would very briefly present the four main strands of uh, the uh, No Disconnect uh, strategy. The No Disconnect strategy, as you or many of you probably already know, is uh, the structured response of the Commission um, to the events of last, uh, Ar sorry, last year's Arab Spring and one of the results of the joint uh, communication of the Commission and uh, the High Representative uh, and Vice President uh, for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Uh, the communication, as you know, is uh, called the Partnership for Democracy and Shared Prosperity with the Southern Mediterranean. One of the actions that uh, uh, the communication uh, launched on this occasion foresees, in particular, the development of tools to assist civil society organizations or individual citizens to circumvent arbitrary disruptions in particular by the indiscriminate surveillance and illegitimate censorship issues that were already 
mentioned by the previous speakers in order to ensure access uh, to internet and other electronic communications. Uh, the strategy tools do not refer just to technical solutions, uh, circumvention tools, but also to citizen empowerment, in particular education and training. This is a very, very important issue because uh, people in this country should learn what the risks and opportunities brought about by internet are in order to fight computer illiteracy, to ensure the security and privacy of communications, as well as uh, to ensure uh, the ability for users to go around censorship where uh, there, are, there is um, um, in place by uh, non-democratic uh, uh, regimes. The second, uh, the second uh, main strength of the no disconnection uh, strategy is related to the development of monitoring preventive capabilities because empowerment should be complemented by other actions. And these uh, preventive capabilities uh, aim to ensure high quality and real time information about regulatory, legal, human rights, and media developments. Uh, these regulatory and uh, preventive capabilities should be coupled with technical capabilities that provide valuable insights about the state of internet uh, in uh, countries uh, in countries uh, which are in under um, authoritarian regimes in order to judge about the integrity, resilience, security, and stability of internet as these are issues which are influenced by um, different kind of um, technological, technical disruptions of the internet. Uh, in addition, uh, the third strand of the no disconnection strategy is the protection of human rights is a shared responsibility and this has been issue already uh, touched upon by the previous speakers. It's not only a responsibility for the public institutions, for the, the individual in, in, EU institutions or national governments, but this is a shared responsibility where close cooperation is uh, particularly uh, important. To this, uh, and it is important that governments and private sector work together to foster uh, corporate social responsibility frameworks compliant with fundamental freedoms, which serve as guidance for uh, companies operating in potentially dangerous environments. For example, when entering new markets, companies must be properly advised of the risks to freedom of expression and privacy that implies that development and export of certain technologies brought about by these new opportunities. It is therefore important for the uh, ICT industry to come up for and implement concrete solutions for self and co-regulation if they do not want public authorities to intervene themselves. And Mr. Wagner already mentioned that sometimes it may not be appropriate to um, expect or to leave to certain companies to implement uh, self-regulation and uh, soft approaches. But this is an area where close discussion, further debates is needed in order to see what would be the most appropriate ways to address these issues. And uh, lastly, the fourth uh, main area dealt with by the strategy is uh, the um, development of uh, international cooperation, the need to develop practical ways to ensure that all stakeholders share, share information on their uh, practices, on the uh, lessons learned, again an issue which was uh, touched upon by, by the previous uh, speakers. In this context, transparency and knowledge sharing are keywords. Uh, by ensuring transparency and knowledge sharing, we can help explore synergies among the different actors to collect and analyze relevant information about internet censorship tools, about practices in uh, given a country, regions, or in uh, more um, in uh, different environments. And finally, uh, let me just briefly tell you that uh, the implementation of this strategy, as I said, 
uh, already is a joint uh, endeavor. Uh, various uh, DGs are involved in the implementation. Um, and um, we are working towards uh, to ensuring an open uh, and inclusive approach, an open uh, debate and discussion with the various stakeholders, uh, including the private sector, the civil society, and uh, various uh, interested uh, other groups in these uh, matters. I'm taking this opportunity to share with you also that the Commission is funding the development of an ICT sector-specific guidelines for EU businesses to help them implement the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, as it was already mentioned as an area of uh, interest uh, for, so for the ICT and the Nokia Siemens networks. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think that was a, a very wide uh, scope from, uh, from each of your perspectives, and I, I want to thank you for that contribution. Uh, I had a few questions, and uh, after that, I think we should just open it up, so I hope you're ready with your questions. Um, I'm very interested in this uh, initiative by the telecom industry or sector to um, discuss uh, human rights issues or uh, corporate social responsibility issues or to learn from each other. Could you say a little bit more about that? Uh, how do you discuss with NGOs, uh, with politicians? Uh, how can we contribute to your learning process, in other words? Um, that's one question for both um, telecom companies. And then I had another question about a comment Mr. Layton made about uh, the difficulty of a deep understanding of how technologies are used in practice versus what they are, are used for. Um, I understand that companies, you know, do a lot of research, but perhaps more from a marketing or a market potential point of view. So what I would like to know is how that deep understanding can be achieved. What is needed for it and is there a role uh, for government? Should we provide these assessments, for example, on a European basis? Uh, which companies can consult confidentially uh, before a license is granted for, for export or for, uh, for updating uh, technologies on the ground in order to ensure that everyone is reading from the same hymn sheet, that there is no distortion in competition because one company might uh, read very closely or assess very closely the human rights uh, impact on the ground and another might not care so much. So perhaps you can you can share your insights there. Uh, and also more broadly, what would you like to see from a political level? This is also a question from ben, for Ben Wagner. Uh, and my last question to both um, Nokia Siemens Networks and uh, Orange, um, especially Orange, I don't know if it's relevant for Nokia Siemens Networks, but is how much revenue was precisely lost in Egypt in those two days? I think that's really interesting because um, on the Egyptian side, the political responsible uh, ministers, politically responsible ministers, have been punished for the revenues lost or the, the cost to the Egyptian economy. Uh, but in that whole law, lawsuit and accountability um, process, the uh, social cost or other cost w was missed, but I I've never heard from companies what, what their damages were. I think that would be really good for us to help you uh, make the case, because there's not only a human rights aspect, but certainly also an economic one, which matters for Europe these days. So um, those are some of my questions, which, which um, uh, your introduction sparked, and hopefully we can, we can open up. I'll just go look around to see hands and, and see where we are with questions from the room while you uh, answer. Maybe uh, you'll, you'll start, yeah? I could start with the dialogue, and then maybe Mark can, can fill in. So the question was, what is this industry dialogue uh, for? Um, as I said, it, it's about sharing best practices, defining common guidelines, really learning from each other. I believe all the examples that we've heard today kind of demonstrate that this really is a complex issue. And, and what we have learned in Anderson is that it, it is not black and white. It is awfully gray. And some of these topics are, are truly complex. What we probably all can, can agree on, I believe all, also around this table, is that kind of on balance in, in general, uh, these kind of technologies are a force for good. I mean, many people have said that the Arab Spring, at least in its current format, would not have been possible without applications such as Facebook or Twitter. 
and they need networks to run on. So, so we need communication networks. But then e even good technology can be misused in, in the wrong hands with bad intentions. And, and really, it is then about understanding the risk, kind of uh, taking the effort to understand the risk to, to, to make that impact assessment and then to decide what to do about it. And we have also learned that when these kind of very complex, very difficult issues come, come around, like Mark also introduced, uh, it, it at least helps to some degree that companies have predefined a position where they are, where they stand with different topics. Because then they have a policy from which to, to, uh, to then uh, uh, kind of uh, take leverage from. So the dialogue, as I said, it is it's about learning from each other. And at the moment, we are in the process of really kind of uh, gathering input from different stakeholders, including uh, non-governmental organizations. So that is happening at the moment. And, and then we hope to define common guidelines. And at some point, we then might even be hosted by another organization. Mark, do you want to continue on, on this question? Uh, yes, just to, to, to tell the story. Uh, actually, I mean, a few, a few weeks after the Egyptian events, uh, we had a call with our, with our friends of uh, Vodafone saying, well, you were trapped in the same issue in Cairo. Uh, I mean, could we, as we are competitors, but could we just think together of uh, how we uh, explain that and what we could do? And then uh, we met very soon Nokia Siemens with which had a um, similar situation in Iran. Uh, I say similar because, I mean, I think that even if we share the same vision, um, there might be some differences between a manufacturer. Uh, I mean, we, we are not operator in Iran, and I understand Nokia Siemens' issues of delivering equipment without any control to a local operator, which can do whatever uh, it wants uh, under the control of local authorities. Uh, we are not selling technology, but I mean, we had the same issue and especially the same question of how can we, as far as we can, prevent that. Uh, by the way, I just would like to remind that um, in the RUGI framework, uh, we are uh, supposed to respect. And uh, I know that uh, many of, many, probably many of you would love that uh, we would protect the Syrian civilians or the uh, Egyptian civilians. Uh, we can do whatever we can in order to make as far as we act under uh, international uh, frameworks or local laws to make things as difficult as possible for local authorities. But we are companies. I mean, we have no machine guns in our um, uh, radio stations. Uh, so, I mean, we want uh, at least to be sure that we are not complicit or naive uh, to do that. So we try to exchange um, a few things and try to build a common answer, given that uh, we are in very different situation and given the fact that um, we, of course, want to be uh, clear in terms of competitive practices, which is something in this, in this room that you can understand. Uh, now uh, we are on the verge of drafting uh, some principles that uh, we would love to share and have feedback from many stakeholders, uh, of course, uh, civil society, but also governments and uh, European bodies. So I think it will be interesting to see that. Uh, to, um, to acknowledge my, um, my little knowledge of that, it was difficult for us during the Egyptian case to know exactly what other governments or European Union could have done so I have no answer to your question. Uh, I just remind, sorry, to, to, to make it again, that we had half an hour under machine guns. So, uh, I mean, within, uh, within half an hour, you can take a decision, yes or no, uh, but uh, escalate uh, on more, let's say, governmental or diplomatic issues. And uh, we had, of course, uh, informal contacts uh, with the French government, and the French government do say do what you, what you can, actually, as a local company. And I just remind you that we were not in control of Mobinil. So, of course, we were one of the major shareholders of Mobinil. Uh, this was on, on the first question. So we are probably going to be a little more public or proactive on what the dialogue can propose and how we can uh, um, extract something from our common thinking. Um, on your proposal, uh, Mrs. Chair, of license or control, 
um, I think for operators, and it might be different for manufacturers, I think the license or the licensing issue is not an issue because most licenses um, are written the same. So the question is not in the, in the license content, which provides for a number of situations, emergency situations, and things like that. So my um, summary would be that the issue is by executing actually the conditions of our license. Uh, but I mean, saying that the license should provide for, uh, I mean, perfect respect of human rights would probably, and this is out of minutes, but uh, would uh, rem remove us out of business in many European countries. Because in many European countries, our license provides for uh, interceptions, location, uh, emergency messages, and things like that, which could be useful for a democratic government to handle emergency situations. So I think the issue is not in the license. The issue is what happens on the field during difficult situations. And I feel that the situation would be how we we explicit the fact um, how we handle those uh, sensitive issues and how we are able to answer uh, governments or police or whatever and how we are able to report what happened. I think that the, the, the case you mentioned, Mrs. Chair, on the uh, Egyptian minister was partly fueled by the report of what happened on this uh, shutdown uh, and the messages and things like that. So being transparent as far as we can. Just remind that uh, uh, some stakeholders in some countries are illegal organizations. So uh, having a transparent dialogue as a licensed company in specific countries with illegal local civilian organizations needs some uh, uh, tuning, I would say. Uh, on the uh, loss of revenue, I mean, uh, of course, it was a matter of two or three days. Uh, I mean, this was not the case, and I think the difficulty is, is not, f I mean, computing that and, I mean, being traceable for that. Uh, and maybe some messages could have been reported, or, I mean, postponed to the next operation day. So it's a difficult calculation, and we don't want to get in that. The, 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 um, the worm was done on the fact that we were not able to be accountable of what was the uh, expectation from our customers, which is, I mean, if, if somebody had a, a medical emergency during this day, I mean, he could have trusted the operation of the network and the network was not available. So it's, it's even, I mean, further than strict uh, loss of revenue. I mean, you just keep in mind that uh, a, telecom a telecom network is providing not only, uh, I mean, uh, non-necessary, uh, but it's, uh, it's a link of life I mean, for medical emergency and things like that. So this was for us a very, believe us, a very difficult decision to take. Thank you. I just wanted to say two things to clarify, perhaps. Um, uh, first of all, I fully agree that it's not all about material costs, but you mentioned hundreds of millions, and I wanted to know the breakdown, but maybe I can find another way. Uh, and to clarify, in terms of licenses, I didn't mean to refer to licenses on the ground in third countries. I meant to refer to export licenses. Okay. Which was not our case. Yeah. Uh, but this would then ensure um, a help desk or some kind of uh, hub on EU level where the assessment of the human rights situation uh, in an updated way and in a context specific way and a sector specific way could be, um, uh, you know, could be uh, assessed before a company does business and this would then provide the sort of clarity which I've heard many companies uh, sort of ask for to on the one hand preserve the level playing field uh, and to on the other hand not get um, the blame in retrospect or to be held accountable for things that are vague or where a company will say, well, this certainly wasn't our intention and we had no way of knowing. Uh, and, and at this point, we have no way to verify what a company knew. Um, and then this would provide us as policymakers an opportunity to say that, that everybody knew the same thing. But uh, that was just a, a clarification of my questions. Uh, Mr. Wagner, did you want to answer a few things? Uh, recommendations to policymakers or? 
and I should turn it off again. Um, uh, from an academic perspective, I'm always a bit perplexed, and this is, uh, goes specifically to some of the, the statements that were made by, um, by the previous speakers from corporations here. I think I, it's possible to agree that um, technologies, especially ICTs in general, can be a force for the good. I think that's out of question. Um, I think it's important to remember, though, that um, people make revolutions, and ICTs don't. And I'm grateful when uh, corporation, I mean, you have a 10% stake in the Tunisian telecoms market, so you have a small stake in the revolution. Um, I think that's a little bit too easy. Um, there's certainly a part to be played for ICTs, but uh, it then should also be mentioned that if we're talking about parts being played, uh, a large part of the Tunisian censorship regime was kept alive by technical consultants from a large French um, telecommunications provider. So it's, it's really a, a question of weighing the scales appropriately and not just looking at the one side but looking at the other and making sure that, um, that when we are telling the history of the past in ways that will allow us to develop policy for the future, we're also looking at all of those aspects. At the same time, it was mentioned that local operators can do whatever they want with the technologies that are exported in specific situations. And I'm a, familiar with at least some cases, again, this comes from my experience of Tunisia and Syria, where specifically um, technology was turned off by uh, the vendor. And this is not necessarily the case for human rights cases, but simply for a far more simple and boring reason that they weren't paying their licensing fees. So we're not just talking about technologies being exported, but systems. And when the systems are exported, there's also parts of those systems that need to be updated on a regular basis. There's licensing fees to be paid, which are typically around 5 to 10 percent of the overall contract. And there's an ongoing relationship, in many cases, between the technology provider and the person involved. Now, to suggest that that's zero control in any amount of situations, that may be the case in some situations. But I think you'll find that in many cases that's not the case. At the same time, this is not to say that it's, it's impossible, that there's, there, are, there are no ways of doing it. It's simply to look specifically at the situations you were mentioning, like in Egypt, where we have a very acute and difficult situation. And I'd sort of like to, rather than make recommendations to policymakers, pose the question back to the companies. In those 30 minutes, what would have been the, the context, the conditions you needed to make a different decision? What would have been, what would have been the, the, the conditions, the, the, the contact persons, the, the policy conditions, the, the scope that would have allowed a company such as yours or any other company that you believe to choose differently? Point. I mean, I think during those 30 minutes, we, we, not we, the Orange Group, but Mobinil actually uh, did the best uh, they, uh, they could at, at this moment, which was to uh, have the CEO fully in control and to refer to the board and to the Egyptian chairman of the board. And uh, we had a few, I mean, they had a few phone calls with, within board members and they eventually uh, made the decision that the risk for the people, uh, for the staff, and for the equipment and the operations of Mobinil was much greater uh, due to the pressure uh, given by the Egyptian government. So, I mean, the only, and I mean, uh, of course, say we, we, we were informed in real time as a minority shoulder that the only decision to be taken, having seized, I mean, all the levels of the company, uh, was to shut down the network. And, and just to say to you, to be able to start up the network the days after as soon as possible, we kept a few uh, what we call Balize signals in order to keep the network in operations. And the uh, Egyptian police detected that some uh, carriers were still under operation and came back uh, in the office to say, we feel that there are still some uh, carriers in operation. So, I mean, the possibility of escaping uh, this request this demand was very little, and we were able, and this was done in the days after, uh, locally and especially in Paris, uh, and uh, our group chairman, Stéphane Richard, was able to explain to the press and to a few um, uh, NGOs that I mean, got in touch how it happened actually, and the little, very little margin of maneuver we kept. So, I mean, and this is probably the things we, we shared with our colleagues, saying that 
probably, and uh, this is an open question I just uh, give to the, to the um, attendants, that the only open question is if, if we would have been able to say that that sort of request would be handled by the board of director and would be able to be reported as is the days after, I mean, in front of the entire world, would have that changed the behavior of the Egyptian police? I don't know, but this is probably one of the little uh, margins we kept. And this is the things we are discussing within the dialogue, mm -hmm. saying what have we learned from the Egyptian case? But I mean, if the story was to be made again, we would probably have um, behaved the same way. Maybe would would have said that this decision was not a technical decision and would have gone the same way to the chairman of the board. That's it. I'm going to look around, or did you want to answer something else, Christo? Well, I just thought I might add on yeah. your earlier question about the deep understanding of product and maybe also yeah. referring to what, what Ben said. Uh, there and, and I, I agree with, with Ben that it, it, you need to look at both sides of the case and, and I guess that's what I also try to uh, refer to with our, our example kind of how we learn that you really need to look at the whole complexity really evaluate kind of it is a good technology as such but could it be misused in wrong hands and, and how we do it and how we achieve this deep understanding of our products is that we have basically the product owner needed experts we might have legal government relations you name it all the people that we need to really evaluate that this product, say a monitoring or a reporting tool, could it be misused in, in, in wrong hands? And, and this could happen anywhere. I mean, um, being a Finn, I could give you a Finnish example. Finland is not exactly known for uh, ICT misuse, right? We are kind of uh, known as developed country, but even in Finland we had a, it's, it's some years back, and I won't now name the names here, but we had a private sector uh, actor who was uh, using a quite normal reporting tool that you can use to basically evaluate that say between uh, three and four o'clock during uh, in, in, in this part of the network uh, mobile phone users are using Facebook so let's target a campaign for them but they could also use the same reporting tool to figure out let's say who was talking to a, a, a newspaper reporter which is a very basic human right freedom of the press so again good technology in, in, in no way intended to, to infringe human rights, but in wrong hands with skillful people, it could somehow be used to that, to that end as well. Um, so just a kind of a ex ex example there. And, and um, then, you know, th then the question comes about how much regulation do we want to add here? And here I would be, you know, skeptical because what we easily then end up doing is that we end up creating actually more problems than, than we solve. Uh, there, there are some, some uh, technologies that are even nowadays under export control, dual use technology as uh, Mrs. Schake referred to, which is technology that, that is civil technology that can be also used for military purposes. And e even very fast communication uh, kind of uh, networks, when they are part of a military solution, would uh, fall under this. And even today, if a company need, wants to export that kind of technology, they would need to apply for an export license. Uh, from their home country. So this is indeed the case, and there's a lot of discussion, should this be expanded? But as I said, these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, discussions, we need to take them very carefully, because as stated, we can create more problems than we actually solve. If I, if I may, I just would like to add one point about the origin of technology. Uh, I agree with uh, Ben Wagner on the, the fact that critical technology are Western technology but um, telecom operated knowledge is no longer a Western technology. I mean, we are a major African player as the Orange Group, but the two major players in Africa are MTN, which is a South African group, and uh, Barty Artel, which is an Indian group. Uh, so, I mean, the question in terms of, uh, let's say, global vision is, uh, if Orange is no longer, uh, I mean, allowed to operate services in certain African countries, Believe me, I mean, MTN, Barty, Artel, and a few other ones will operate telecom operators in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, and they know very well, and we are competing against them everywhere. So I think the question is, I mean, training and, and having and teaching about human rights, local applications, and being transparent, and educating, evangelizing, is probably more important than being very restrictive. And I think this is very important, by the way, for our local people. 
I mean, our local people in Egypt are Egyptians, in Ivory Coast, they are Ivorians. Uh, and uh, of course, there is the orange brand and there are the orange processors and some orange values that we decline on the field. But um, I mean, the, the telecom service market is very open to non-European players. Thank you so much. I've seen a few hands, uh, but I also have two small things to say. Otherwise, I think we're talking about different things. Uh, and then I'll go to Christian Engstrom first. Can, can everyone else? All right, so I see three questions already. Great, okay, I'll come to you. Uh, I think one thing that needs to be said is that of course we have problems in Europe. And, and systems can be abused, but there is a fundamental difference where I would still hope that in Finland, if um, you know, I was talking to a reporter through a tool that was meant to use what products I use online, that I could go to court and have a fair trial, and that I would not be dragged from my home, uh, you know, tortured in a cell, uh, or killed on the spot for carrying a phone in the first place, and people would know where I am. And I think that's a really, really important difference. Uh, and yes, um, this context is important. Yes, technology is made by other companies as well. And this competition is also real. And this is a, a question that makes this a politically very, very important question, not only from a business point of view, but from a strategic point of view, from a trade point of view, from a security point of view, uh, et cetera. Um, but sometimes te technical aspects are important for us to, to understand and really do make a difference. So I want to ask how it was technically possible for the Egyptian government to use the network if it was as down as it was. So did they have autonomous control over the network in Egypt? In other words, could the government access the technologies or were telecom providers forced to, to let certain messages through and thereby um, creating a controlled capacity? Or how did that work? I, I, Oh, I mean, actually, it's very simple. I mean, during those 30 minutes, we were requested, Mobinil was requested to shut down properly the network and to be sure to report that the network was down, that, that nobody in Cairo could use the network. And the threat was very easy. I mean, your equipment needs power. If you do not shut down the network by yourself, we will ask the power company to close the power supply to your equipment, which would be technically a disaster. It's you remove the plug, which never do that with a computer, never do that with a telecom network. But I mean, the arguments of the Egyptian police no, no, was very simple. They were able to unplug our network. No, that's very clear. But what <laughs> happened in Egypt as well is that the government of Mubarak was sending text messages. Yeah, you're right. And how did, was that technically possible? Because I understand, you know, 30 minutes uh, anecdotes and gunpoint and risk of people on the ground. I mean, that, and it's very valuable for us to learn. And, and I, I think that that context you very clearly explained. What I'm trying to exp understand is how it was possible for the Mubarak government to send propaganda text messages while people could not communicate to each other uh, for health. Actually, it's a good question. Actually, it was not done at the same time. Okay. I mean, I think it was. Uh, I mean, it was separated by one or two days. I mean, the the uh, I don't remember the exact case, but uh, I think shutting down the network was, I mean, intended to remove the mobility of protesters, and I mean, uh, hinder the possibility for them to gather and yeah. to escape police forces, and the the SMSs were sent the day after, in prevent. I mean, to prevent a new. A, a new protest, and uh, so it was. It was not uh, during the same the same period, and actually, it was um, a message that was written and requested to be sent during the operation of the network. By the way, I just give you a point. Uh, we our teams locally, and they were quite courageous. Um, I mean, succeeded to add to the message message from government, blah blah blah. So it was clear for our customers that this was a message we were just carrying. But of course, I mean, the first request from the authorities were not message from the government, blah, blah, blah. No, I understand. Okay, so that did not happen at the same time. I think that's a very valuable piece of information. Um, first Christian Engstrom, then the, uh, Reagan in the back, and this gentleman in the blue shirt, uh, and then I'll look around for more questions. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, Christian Engstrom, uh, member in the, in the Green Group. I got, I got, a, got a question for the Commission. I, I think this uh, no, no disconnect strategy, uh, I think that sounds like a, like a very, very good thing, and I think it is something that the European Union can usefully do to try and, well, in, in various soft ways uh, to export the ideas of democracy and fundamental rights, etc. But I, I got a question. Don't, don't you find it problematic when, when you're talking to, to foreign governments about a no disconnect strategy that, that European member states have laws that aim at disconnecting users? I'm talking about the Hadopi law in France and the Digital Economy Act in, in the UK, for instance. I mean, how, how, how do you explain that, that it's okay to shut users off in Europe, but they really, really shouldn't do it outside Europe? Is that difficult? Thank you for your question. Uh, as we said, as, as I already mentioned, uh, the issue of uh, protection of human rights is a global issue. Um, we are discussing uh, the importance of uh, the participation of EU industry, their uh, participation globally in the economy in other countries, but we should take into account uh, that we these efforts need to be at global level. We should learn from the experience of other companies, of other countries. Therefore, we should look for different kind of cooperation mechanism to knowledge, to share knowledge, to, know, to, to, to share experience. We already discussed, I mean, we should have an open approach in our uh, contacts and communication with the private sector, with the civil society, with the academia, to see what are the appropriate measures which need to be taken. As you, as you see, I mean, we are discussing here whether, um, whether self-regulation, co-regulation could be appropriate measures, and I now hear two different opinions. Of course, the Commission would not like to uh, promote measures, regulatory measures, unless it is not very necessary, but would like to see how the private business itself can come up with uh, suggestions and uh, uh, measures, actions which uh, can uh, make them uh, promote the human rights, make them more responsible in uh, this area. I hope I managed to reply to your question. It's about, uh, uh, if I have understood you uh, uh, correctly, discussions, I don't know to what extent when, when you say globally, internationally, probably you have uh, some particular reference in, uh, in mind, but uh, we should be open to discuss these issues beyond the EU, and we should uh, also uh, seek um, opportunities to learn from uh, various uh, experience of other countries and regions. Thank you. Uh, Reagan? Um, oh, I also have a question. Oh. I'm Reagan. <laughs> Sorry, I'll take you next. There's a lady behind you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Reagan McDonald. I'm from uh, Digital Rights Group um, Access. Um, and we actually have done quite a bit of advocacy around uh, telcos, especially Vodafone, um, after Egypt. And we do very much welcome this um, telco kind of human rights dialogue you have. Um, but I would like to know what specific NGOs you have been consulting um, or and also, why not join an already established multi-stakeholder platform like the Global Network Initiative? Um, and also, just to let you know that Access would be very happy to to have a seat at that table in in those discussions when you when you do consult NGOs. Um, and my second question is for the gentleman at Nokia Siemens. And I also think um, it's really great that you've adopted the human rights due diligence diligence process. But I just have a question about how that plays out in practical terms. Um, so what what kind of criteria do you use to, to use this process? Is it um, a human rights impact assessment? And what are the specific criteria that you use to deny sale? And if you could give us a specific example of when Nokia Siemens did deny the sale of, of technology. Thanks. So uh, you asked about the NGOs that we have talked with, so very many indeed. Um, I have, I have not been in, in all those meetings, obviously, but as, as they did, Access Now is one of the NGOs we have talked with. I've personally talked with, I believe, Brett Solomon yeah. from Access. So uh, he's one of the people, I mean, very many, and we, we need to learn, get different viewpoints. Um, then you asked about uh, the due diligence uh, in, in practical terms. So kind of um, to, to, to make it uh, simple, how, how it works is that 
is that for each sale, we first look at, at the country. So what is the country uh, that this uh, sale would, would happen in? And, um, and then we evaluate the country risk related to this particular country. And, and we use this uh, something called ICT misuse index, which is provided to us by a third party. It's a, a, a non-profit organization recommended by United Nations called Maplecroft. They are specialized in this kind of risk uh, assessments. And, um, and, they let, and, and assuming then that we have a high risk country, then one flag goes up. Then we look at the product risk. So then again, we evaluate, even if it's, as, as I stated, good technology could be used for normal purposes, like, like reporting. Could it be in wrong hands used uh, for un, unintended purposes? And then second flag goes up. If, if this product is in this predetermined product list, which, is, which then includes these kind of a, these kind of products. And then once two flags have gone up, then, then we assemble this, uh, this uh, kind of a group of people to, to look at this particular case. So we look at them at case by case once we have these two flags that have been, have been risen. And um, yeah, as, as I stated, this process has resulted in, de in denying sales. Uh, I can't go into specifics, obviously here, but you know, it, it, there, are, there are countries where this has happened. Uh, Maybe something that is public, which I can state here without in infringing any contractual agreements, is that we have decided to pull out of, uh, we are pulling out of Iran, for example, currently. So it, it just might give you one, uh, one example. So we, we don't do any sales in the future in, in this country, for example. Sorry, is, is the ICT um, misuse index, is that public information that we could? Well, this ICT misuse index, actually, Mabel Croft is doing it for us for us, uh, for our purposes specifically. Okay, and I also am aware that Brett Solomon has, has been speaking, but as far as I was aware, it was more trying to discuss. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah. We are, of course, all, always happy to, to continue discussing with, with that. So are we, thanks. Okay, um, the gentleman in the blue shirt, no more? Okay, uh, since when was the, the entire stop with uh, trading with Iran? Is that recent? So we, uh, we made a decision in our executive board, I believe end of last year, that now we are, we are, we are pulling out. Uh, when, when you are pulling out, we do it in this kind of a, um, managed way. Mm -hmm. So you don't simply stop shipping immediately, but it, it will take some time just to get the people out, get the, to, to terminate the contracts and all, all of this. Otherwise, you might face penalties and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th I've understood sometimes EU sanctions can help prevent these penalties, so that's really interesting too. Um, the gentleman over there. Yes, well, sorry for speaking for my uh, call. Um, I'm Jeroen, I'm a security technology student, and I have a question about the second point uh, of the no disconnect strategy from the committee. Um, the committee wants to uh, assist the citizens having secure access to the internet. I think that's a good idea, but uh, from a security perspective, I think the threat then comes to the end user device, the uh, computer or the uh, smartphone where the citizens will communicate uh, on. And if people think they have a safe connection, well, they probably talk uh, more freely, and that um, makes the threat bigger for them because the end systems will be targeted next. And is this also part of your vision to? Uh, also secure that part of the communication channel. Thank you for your question. Uh, indeed, we are looking at various aspects in developing, uh, further developing these actions, including in, uh, these aspects that you've just uh, mentioned. You can understand that for security reasons, we cannot enter into uh, great details discussing the strategy and the concrete actions that we are envisaging. But I would like also to refer to previous uh, issues that were raised about the training and empowerment of citizens, so training ed and education. They should be aware of the risks and threats that they face when dealing with these communications, and they should have the knowledge how to uh, overcome and go beyond this, go around the censorship and surveillance. Are there any other questions? No? Yes, go ahead. 
Hello, my name is Camina Mancon, and I have a question for Nokia Siemens. I would like to know if with it, the, this private initiative, you're considering working and cooperating with the commission initiative to, provide, to promote uh, CSR guidelines, because taking into account the order of magnitude of this, uh, this topic, what the risk we may run at the moment is that there are several disjointed initiatives, one coming from private sector, and other ones coming from civil society, and there is no way to, to get to, uh, to come to terms with this problem if we all not join forces, and I think that the Commission at the moment is provided the suitable framework to do so. So I wanted to know if Nokia is thinking about cooperating or whether uh, the industry uh, dialogue is willing to do so. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, uh, definitely we need to get all this kind of input into our process as well. I will definitely kind of refer this uh, specific uh, guideline example that you gave to my colleague who is from our side coordinating our industry dialogue effort. And what I could say also uh, kind of added to this is that uh, that you are right, there's a lot of approaches uh, to ICT and human rights. Luckily, however, now we have one very good framework, uh, which hopefully will provide at least one focal point within the industry. And this is this uh, John Rocky framework that we have referred to uh, sim uh, um, several uh, times during this discussion already. So, the However, it would be uh, suitable to have one uh, a common European position, and that's what the Commission is trying to do with these guidelines. Also, the Commission is taking as, a, as an example the Rocky framework, of course. But yes, yes. Maybe if I, if I may extend to about the Rocky framework for those of, of the audience who are not familiar with, it, with this. So for several years, uh, also under the UN umbrella, uh, different nations and, and actors have tried to find common guidelines how to approach this very complex topic. And there was first a, a draft guideline, but uh, there the parties were quite far apart. So then uh, the UN uh, uh, General Secretary uh, then uh, commissioned this, uh, this, uh, this work uh, by this uh, uh, special representative on human rights, Mr. John Rackey, he's a professor, very well known uh, uh, kind of a writer in, in this topic. And he spent several years talking with different actors. And finally, then he came up with this framework, which can be summarized in these three words, protect, respect, and remedy. And basically, these, these three words go for, for the, for the um, topics that, that uh, governments should protect human rights, uh, companies should respect, and that is what, what we are, what is our responsibility. And then um, the, the victims of uh, human rights infringement should have access to remedy. And, and basically, regarding now our role to respect human rights. So there are different steps that companies should take. For example, they, they must explicitly state that they respect human rights. They must have a policy. They must have a due diligence process. They must uh, do these human rights impact as, uh, assessments, and they must report on the results. And these are the steps that we are following. And it, it's basically the, it's the same type of approach that you have in many areas of life, in different types of standardizations even, that you have this this uh, common approach that gives you, or even enables you to have this kind of cycle of continuous improvement, that you have some baseline. You document what's your position, you, you have a process, you follow it, you report the results, you get feedback, you improve constantly. And I, I, I mean, for me, this is very uh, fruitful approach. And we've been, discuss we've, we've been discussing here now in several comments, uh, should there be self-regulation or should, let's say, EU do something more in enforcing. There's always, of course, you know, room for also uh, official regulation, sure. But we need to be very careful with this. And, and I would say that at least in this case, we should give this self-regulation a try because really this is a complex topic. Companies are learning from each other, as you can also hear from, from this panel. And, and we need to try to develop this further. But also then, as, as EU actors, we should remember that this is a, this is a global phenomenon. So indeed, uh, what we should be striving for is a level playing field. Because if, if say, EU-based companies pull out of somewhere and some other companies don't, again, it might not be the, the actual, actual end result that we want. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, just to comment. I think uh, the UE uh, is a leader in terms of human rights. It can definitely play a role. I'm not sure on the orange point of view that this it starts by a regulatory question. Uh, maybe exportations or control of exports is a regulatory question and actually is. But uh, when you see uh, local infringements due to interceptions, location, whatever, shutdown of networks, 
it's a bottom-up issue that raise out of, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, but out of the uh, straightforward regulatory, European regulatory framework. So the key question, and this is why I'm here, is how can we join our forces to make sure that us in those countries and our local people in the countries, when they are facing a difficult decision, and I just remind once again that the distinction, especially in difficult states, uh, for instance, I mean, we are operator in Ivory Coast. Probably 15 years ago, when we got the license in Ivory Coast, we are the operator of the incumbent in Ivory Coast. I mean, they would have no issue in this room about Ivory Coast and human rights in Ivory Coast. They might have some uh, small issues because nobody's perfect, even in Europe. But, I mean, nobody would have objected the fact that Orange would be operator in Ivory Coast. In the last decade, things started to deteriorate, and in the last two years, it was a nightmare for everybody. For the citizens, for the companies, we lost uh, uh, half of our revenue, half of our um, I mean, investment was lost. I mean, we had casualties. I mean, this was a difficult situation. But when you look at the legal aspects, at the regulatory aspects, I mean, there was nothing left to do. I mean, we have a license in Ivory Coast. We are forced to operate telecoms in Ivory Coast for, I don't remember, it might be 10 years or 15 years. We are on the ground. We do our best to operate that. And the question is, when local power decide to do something that here in this room, we would feel against the human rights, what do we do in Abidjan? So the question probably, and sorry for my colleague from the Commission, is not a question of co-regulation or self-regulation. It's a question of how Orange Ivory Coast can be supported by the people in this room to make the best decisions in some cases in 30 minutes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, great. I think that's um, 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 a good comment to, to start finalizing. Uh, I'm going to look at the panel whether there's any final thoughts from anyone or otherwise I'll give the floor to Anneli and then I'll say some things in the end or do you want me to go first and then you end? I want to thank all of you. I think this has been very useful discussion and uh, the questions you have given us and the answers you have given has been important to, to evaluate this issue and uh, I hope that it has been also good output to our group's work in the future because this is one of the main questions in the future. Human rights and technologies, what will happen in the future and how the environment will change and how should we regulate it or should we regulate it at all so that this was good output but I think that we must continue our discussions. Thanks, all of you. Thank you so much. I can only agree. Um, I think it's important to note that as members of the Alliance mm. of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, our political group, um, we are known to uh, try to limit bureaucracy and uh, over-regulation. So that is mm. never a goal in and of itself. Mm. Um, but we're also faced with the core <laughs> responsibilities of government in democracies in a changing world. And one of the core responsibilities of governments, um, and also at the EU level, is to protect and even to promote the respect uh, and guarantees of human rights. And sometimes if, if the environment or the world or technologies change, it means that laws and regulations have to be adjusted. And it doesn't always mean that there is an extra layer or um, uh, an over-regulation, it's certainly not our goal. And I think also as liberals, we're in the middle of a political spectrum